I want you to take your, take your mind and go with me about 3,000 years. 3,000 years, there was a man by the name of David. And David was a man that was at his zenith, at his apex. He had won wars. He had won battles. And it seems as if that uh, he had come to a point of where everything was of prosperity. There was peace in the land. The territory had grown from 6,000 square feet to 60,000 square feet. David now is the king, of, finally has become the king of Israel. And there, there was peace and prosperity. Like that land had never seen it before. Why, there was a chicken in every uh, oven, and there was a uh, a chariot in every garage. There was great prosperity. And right there in the midst of his prosperity, he said something to one of his servants that had been on his mind for a number of years. He said, is there anyone else of the house of Saul, which was his arch enemy, that are living today? I can almost imagine that when he said that, his servant says, ah, I know. David is what he is getting ready to do. He's getting ready to exterminate any of that king's family. And then he said something that was so unusual and surprising. He said that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Kindness. We're in a series of messages on grace. Grace. That unmerited favor of God. Something that we do not deserve or something that you cannot earn, something that you cannot pay for. But that grace, it's interesting that that word kindness in the Hebrew is the counterpart of the New Testament word grace. In other words, what he was saying, that I might show grace to the family of Saul. Now, you remember Saul was his arch enemy for a number of years, and Saul had tried to kill David. And back in those days and time, when a king would come and began to sit upon the throne, that if there were any other of the family of the former king, they would be exterminated, fearing that there might be a revolt against the new king. So it would have been only natural and normal for David to exterminate Saul's family. But no. What David said, I want to show kindness. I want to show the grace of God upon that individual like God has shown grace to me. Every one of us who have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, have experienced what is called the amazing grace. The amazing grace of God. Can you imagine? Here a holy, righteous God 
willing to accept a sinner as filthy rags as our righteousness could portray. And yet, by his amazing grace, he accepts us into his family. Isn't that wonderful? One of the greatest lessons in the Old Testament about God's amazing, unconditional grace is found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. I want you to take your Bibles. And let's read this story. Now, as we read this story, I want you to keep three things in mind. Number one, David is a picture of God who extends grace. Saul's grandson, which is Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, is a picture of us as sinners. And this whole story is a picture of salvation, of God's amazing, wonderful, unmerited grace. And let's look at it today. Would you stand with me as we read these first 13 verses of Scripture? 2 Samuel, chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now David said, is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul? And then he says this, which was so surprising to those that were listening, that I may show him Kindness for Jonathan's sake. I may show him grace for Jonathan's sake. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your servant, at your service. Then the king said, Is there not someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God, the grace of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear. For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed, his, bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all of his house. 
You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work in the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king had commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. Father, what a beautiful, beautiful story of your amazing grace, that unconditional grace of how David extended to the life of Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson. Lord, how we can identify with that today because, Lord, we understand that it's because of your grace we have the fellowship that we have today. And, Father, I pray that you would show us and reveal to us the way that you are demonstrating your grace in the lives of individuals in so many ways. Today, I pray if there's one that have never accepted that invitation for for them to come and sit at your table to be a part of your family, that today would be the day of that salvation. So, Father, I pray that your spirit will anoint and fill us. And I pray, dear Father, that you will use us for your glory and for your honor. Because we ask this under no other name but the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Would you be seated? What a beautiful, beautiful Old Testament story between David and Mephibosheth. I want you to see grace being exercised and demonstrated in the way that God did it in your life and my life through the life of David and through Mephibosheth. First of all, I want you to notice about the requirement of grace. Now, you'll notice the Bible calls this grandson by the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is an interesting name. Mephibosheth literally means a shameful thing. In other words, when people would call his name out, they would think of, here is a shameful thing. Now you stop and you think about it. It was a shameful thing. Here was a man who was and should have been a prince of a kingdom. But no, he's lame. He's a pauper. He's on the backside of the desert, fearing for his life. No doubt, yes, he was a shameful, shameful thing. It was because of his conditions. His condition reminded us of us as well as we think about as 
a lost person. A shameful thing to be out of the fellowship of a holy God. What a shame it would be to come into a house of God such as this and hear about the grace of the living God who loves you and who have died for you and walk out the door rejecting him. What a shameful, shameful thing. But you'll notice here, he came from a corrupted family, just like you and I. Here was a young man. Here was a man that was born in the family of Saul, one that was an adversary to David. My friend, the Bible talks about that when we're born into this world, that we're born into a corrupted family. We're born within the family of Satan, a family of the devil, because of our nature. The Bible reminds us in Psalms 51, verse 5, where he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And then, of course, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, reminds us that we are of the nature of the children of wrath. By nature, we are the children of wrath. See, people are sinners not only by choice, but by nature. It just comes natural. You stop and you think about, you take a little child, as sweet, as innocent as they are, but yet, you know what? They're nothing but little sinners. You don't have to teach them to tell a lie. You have to teach them not to tell a lie. You don't have to teach them to steal. You have to teach them not to steal. Why is that? It is because by nature... This comes natural. We're all sinners. And we're all corrupted because that we are part of that family. See, when we were born, we were born into the family of Adam. Adam sinned. And that's the reason why the Bible talks about that we should be reborn born again into the family of God because of our nature. But then I want you to notice here, look what the Bible says in verse 3. There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame at his feet. Who is lame at his feet. Zeba, David's servant, said, There is still one son left. His name is Jonathan, but he is lame at his feet. Now, why was he lame at his feet? Second Samuel chapter four, verse four, explains what happened. When Jonathan, Saul's son, had Mephibosheth that he had an incident that took place in his life. He says that he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, so his name was Mephibosheth. In other words, he being an arch enemy of David, fearing for his life that this nurse that was carrying this little baby, and that as she was carrying, she was running to go and to hide this little baby. And she fell, she falls. And she crushes the feet of Mephibosheth. 
When I look at that story, I'm reminded of, of how Mephibosheth was a cripple all of his life. All of his life. My friend, you know, the Bible talks about something very interesting. It's saying that, uh, that David was an individual that began to exercise of trying to bring Mephibosheth back into his family. Well, friend, I think about of the way that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, of how he draws us. The Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me. It's the Spirit of God that draws us. And you think about a, 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 a crip. A spiritual man is crippled. He has limitations. One that is lost. But then you'll notice that what he says in verse 4, that he's from the house of Mature. Mature means soul. In other words, it literally means that he was sold under bondage, that we are a slave to sin. John chapter 8, verse 34 says, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. There's really no such thing as truly a free will. You take a man that is lost, He's a slave to sin. For example, we have individuals that, who are recognized as alcoholics. Why? Because they're a slave to alcohol. I want to go a step further, and I want to say there is such a thing as sin holic. You're a slave to sin. It comes natural, and it's something that you continue to do. Sinners, as the Bible reminds us, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible said that in verse 4 that he was living in Lodabar. Lodabar, which literally means a place of no pasture, a barren place. In other words, think about it for a moment. Here is a grandson of a king of the mighty nation of Israel. Where is he living? He's living on the backside of the desert, a barren place. He is living like a pauper. He is living like a pauper in a pigsty. My friend, we're in a world today that people think that they can just live it up, and yet their heart is barren. It's like a desert. Living is not living it up. Living is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says, as the Bible says that uh, uh, in this place of no pastor, a barren place. Billy Graham says something one time that really interested me, which I believe he was right on target. Billy Graham said, there is an essential emptiness in every life without Christ. Tolstoy put it this way. There is a God-shaped vacuum in every life, and only God can fill that vacuum. Today, men and women, boys and girls, are living a life. They may appear that they have everything in the world, 
materially, but inwardly, they're like they're living on the backside of a desert. There is a vacuum that only God can come and fill that vacuum. That's right. And so there you began to see of how Mephibosheth is truly a picture of a sinner. But what about David, a picture of a Savior? I want you to see the rendering of grace. You know what Mephibosheth needed? He didn't need justice because if he got justice, they would have killed him. He didn't need mercy because if he had got mercy, they would have left him where he was at. You know what Mephibosheth needed? He needed grace. Grace. Every one of us, we need the grace of Almighty God. And without that grace, my friend, we are left empty and barren. Now, you see this picture. Now, I want you to notice the seeking of his grace. The Bible says in verse 5, Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. David did not wait on Mephibosheth to come to him, but David went to Mephibosheth. Have you noticed that that's the way it is with the Lord today? God doesn't wait on the sinner. God goes to the sinner. I have heard people say before, I have found the Lord. No, you didn't find the Lord. The Lord found you. That's right. You remember when Adam, died, uh, Adam fell in the garden? Nowhere in the scriptures do you find Adam's going around and saying, God, where are you? But what does the scripture say? It says that God says, Adam, where art thou? God comes seeking. And my friend, that's exactly what he does in your life and my, my life today. It's the spirit of God. I heard one man say, ask this other man, have you found the Lord? He said, found the Lord. He said, I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> it's the picture, as you re are reminded of, of the good shepherd. Leaving the 99 and going and trying to find that one lost soul. And you remember what he does? Once he finds him, what does he do? He picks him up, puts him on his shoulders, and he carries him back to the rest of the fall. My friend, if you're saved today, you know why? It's because God sought after you. That the Spirit of God worked through circumstances and situations in your life to bring you to an understanding of your need of coming to know Christ. You're talking about grace. Why would God want me? Why would God want you? It is because of his grace that he comes and he comes seeking. That's what David did. He went and began to seek after Mephibosheth to seek him. You see that seeking grace. But I want you to see something else. I want you to notice the saving grace. It says he brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. Now I want you to just envision the scene here just for a moment. Mephibosheth gets the word that David wants him to come and be a part of his kingdom and live in his, his palace. 
Well, Mephibosheth said, I can't go because I'm lame. Can you imagine the scene as David's servants had that who had been dispatched to go to Mephibosheth and said, son, we're here to take you to David. We're here to take you to the king. And not only here, I want you to look outside. We have a brand new chariot just for you. See, it's one thing to be invited to a dinner. It's another thing when that host comes and gets you in a limousine and brings you to the house. That's the way the Lord works in our lives. Oh, God loves the sinner. But notice the sovereign grace. He says in verse 7, or verse 1 and verse 7, that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Isn't that interesting? And then he went on a step further. He says in verse 7, I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. He wasn't doing this for Mephibosheth. He was doing it for Jonathan. You may not realize this. God the Father, why he seeks you. Oh, yes, he loves you. But really, he's doing it for Christ's sake. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Listen to this. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Has forgiven you. Salvation is all of God. Have you ever thought about that? God thought of it. Jesus bought it. The Spirit of God wrought it. Satan fought it, and I caught it. (laughs) That's what salvation is all about. It is all of God. It is not what you have done, but it's what God has done in your life. But then, I want you to see the reception of this grace. It says, when David shares with Mephibosheth, He's going to, uh, uh, he says in verse 8, that then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Mephibosheth said, David, why would you want me? I'm nothing but an old dead dog. Friend, I want you to understand, that's what grace does. It humbles you. And yet at the same time, it does not inflate you. It humbles you, and it does not debase you. Here, was Mephibosheth, and there he is so humbled. And friend, if you're going to come before the Lord, you must humble yourself. Charles Spurgeon said this, the higher a man is in grace, the lower he will be in his own esteem. And how so true. You know the reason why God cannot get into a lot of people's hearts today? It's because they're so filled with their own self. We've got a bunch of spiritual peacocks that are strutting around thinking that they're too good to go to hell. But friend, I'm in here to remind you, I don't care where you live, what you possess, I don't care 
how much money you have. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, you are like Mephibosheth. You know, but an old dead dog. That's right. All have sinned. And Mephibosheth said, I am nothing but an old dead dog. Let me try to explain it to you of the way that this grace is so demonstrated. There was this Indian that had been saved. And somebody said, explain to us what took place. He reaches down and he picks up some leaves and then he takes a worm and he puts those that worm on those leaves. And then he takes a match and he lights those leaves and they begin to crinkle and to begin to burn. And it's getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the worm. And then about that time, he reaches down with his hands and he picks the worm out of that fiery blaze. And this is what he said. He said, the worm, me, the hand, God. And that's what God has done is by his amazing grace that he reaches down and he picks us up out of judgment. And that's what Mephibosheth experienced here today. The grace of God. But you notice what, what, what David said to him in verse 7. He says, do not fear. Now, I think that's interesting. I think for his whole entire life, he has lived in fear. He has lived knowing that he was from the house of Saul, the arch enemy of the new king, David. Knowing good and well what was common that day was that the former kingdom would be exterminated. So you can imagine every day he's walking in the shadow of fear. Every day he is walking thinking that today might be a knock on the door of King, of King David's men. But David said, hey, Mephibosheth, do not fear. Do not fear. Do you know one of the greatest commandments that the Lord Christ gave when he was walking on the face of the earth? Fear not. Oh, it's amazing what your conscience can do to you of getting you to live in fear. It's amazing of how you can live in constant fear, fear, fear. Many a person today are in mental institutions because they're living in fear. But Jesus Christ said, by the grace that I extend to you, you don't have to live in fear. One of the greatest blessings that God gives to us is, of course, the joy of our salvation that overcomes fear. So we see not only that renewed fellowship, but also I want you to see what he says in verse, uh, verses 7, 10, 11, and 13. Listen to what David goes on to say. For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Four different times. 
in verse 7, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 13. He said, you shall eat bread at my table. You shall eat bread at my table. Now, why is that so important? It must be pretty important because the Holy Spirit would not have recorded it four different times in the Scriptures. There's something unique and intimate about sitting around the table and fellowshipping over a meal. David said to Mephibosheth, I want you to come and I want you to sit at my table. I want you to eat with my family. In other words, what he is saying to me, no longer you have to eat like a pauper, but now you can live like a prince. My friend, I want you to understand, no longer you have to be a slave to Satan, now you can be a servant to the Lord. No longer do you have to live in fear, but now you can live in contentment. But I want you to see something else in this scripture that amazes me. Look what he says in verse 9. He says, And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul, and to his entire house. Talking about grace. David said, what's mine is yours. My kingdom is yours. My home is yours. My palace is yours. My table is yours. Have you ever thought about the riches that you receive when you invite Christ into your life. Everything that Christ has is available to you. You think about the power of his resurrection. It's available to you. You think about the strength of Christ. It's available to you. All that Christ has has now become available to you. To you. He goes on to say in verse 10 You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work for the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son shall have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had. 15 sons and 20 servants. Do you see what happened here? Because of David's grace, Mephibosheth, who was a pauper, who was a servant, now he's got 35 people serving him. 35 people waiting on him hand and foot. Did you realize as children of God that you have servants? Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. But to who but to which of the angels has he ever said sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Ministering spirits. But you'll notice that he welcomed him into the royal family. He says in verse 11, As for Mephibosheth, and the king said, He shall eat at my table like one of my sons. From a pauper to a prince. From the desert to the palace. Can you imagine? He now has become officially part of the family of the king. 
Oh, friend. The Bible tells us that we serve a risen Savior who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he has called you to come and be a part of his family. What a family. What a blessing. Chuck Swindoll has summarized the picture here. And I want to read it to you. Listen to what he says. Imagine a typical scene several years later. The dinner bell rings through the king's palace. David comes to the head of the table and sits down. In a few moments, Ammonon, one of David's sons, clever, crafty Ammonon, sits to the left of David. Lovely and gracious Tamar, the daughter of David, a charming and beautiful young woman, arise and sits beside Ammonon, her brother. Then across the way comes Solomon, walks slowly from his study, precautious, Brilliant, preoccupied Solomon. The heir apparently slowly sits down, and then here comes Absalom, the other son of David. Handsome, winsome, Absalom with that long flowing black hair as a raven, And then he sits down. On this particular evening, Joab, the courageous warrior and David's commander of the troops, has been invited to dinner. Muscular, bronze Joab is seated near the king. Afterward, they wait. They hear something. They hear the shuffling of feet, the clump, the clump, the clump of the crutches. As Mephibosheth rather awkwardly finds his place at the table and slips into his seat, and at that time the tablecloth covers his feet. And then he said, I ask you, did Mephibosheth understand what grace was all about? Wasn't that amazing? What a picture. His crippledness was under the table of the king that was not seen. But he's sitting there just like Ammon. Tamar, Absalom, Solomon, just like one of the all the, the children of David. Talking about grace, the amazing, unconditional grace. Friend, could you be possibly that Mephibosheth today. Could you possibly be that person that was born in the wrong family, crippled in a fall, on the backside of the desert, feeling like an old dead dog? David expressed and exercised the wonderful grace, the loving kindness of God. 